Hello, everyone. My name is Frida Afari. I am an Iranian American librarian, translator, writer, and producer of the blog Iranian Progressives in Translation. In a recent article in New Politics, an independent socialist journal in the US, I drew connections between the Black Lives Matter uprising in the US, the current mass uprising in Myanmar, Burma, and the ongoing struggles in Iran as movements which confront issues of police brutality, mass incarceration, militarism, and authoritarianism. Today's one hour long dialogue will further delve into these struggles their similarities and differences, and ways to create collaboration among activists from these three movements. In fact, if there were any doubts about the urgency of addressing these connections, the latest statement of Michael Flynn, a Trump advisor, about the need for a Myanmar-style military coup in the US, shows that the Republicans are drawing connections between Myanmar and the US for their own fascistic purposes. Today, I will be speaking with two amazing women about uprisings against police brutality, mass incarceration in Myanmar, Burma, US, Iran, and pathways to solidarity. Debbie Stothart is an active promoter of human rights in Burma and the ASEAN region. During her 32-year career, she has worked as a journalist, community educator, education consultant, governmental advisor, and trainer in Malaysia, Australia, and Thailand. In 1996, she founded the Alternative ASEAN Network on Burma and was elected Secretary General of the International Federation for Human Rights, FIDH, in 2013. She developed the first ongoing women-specific human rights training program for Myanmar in 1997, an initiative which is ongoing and has supported many local and national young women leaders in Myanmar. Romarilyn Ralston is the program director of Project Rebound, at California State University Fullerton, a program that supports the higher education and successful reintegration of the formerly incarcerated. She served 23 years at the California Institution for Women and is a longtime member and organizer with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Incarcerated at age 24 and released at age 47, Romarilyn has seen and survived the effects of extreme sentencing and medical neglect in prison. Since her release, Romarilyn has earned a bachelor's degree in gender studies and a master's degree in liberal arts. She has been a Women's Policy Institute fellow, a volunteer with the Ferguson, Missouri Commission, and an organizer with the formerly incarcerated convicted people and families movement, a voting rights campaign in Florida. Romarilyn is a prison abolitionist tirelessly advocating for the women she left behind in prison in California, many serving life without the possibility of parole. So welcome Romarilyn and Debbie, and thank you so much for giving me this time at me and the rest of our audience, this, your, your very precious time. So we'll start with Debbie. And uh, here's a question for Debbie. Can you tell us about some of the unique features of the Burmese uprising? What compelled the majority of the population to come out so forcefully and persistently in opposition to police brutality and authoritarianism? How is it that women, oppressed ethnic minorities, and labor struggles are in the forefront? What is their unique participation, and what are they demanding? Thank you for having me, and it's such an honor being on the same conversation with both of you, especially Romarilyn, who's 
um, that just just so inspiring. Um, you know, when we talk about the Burmese uprising, basically we've seen a nationwide movement uh, made up of the civil disobedient movement as well as local general strike committees that came out in response to the 1st of February coup. And uh, the, the, the intensity and uh, the energy into this opposition to the coup is uh, coming from the understanding that this, is, this coup is not complete. The military that the military junta that grabbed power still has not gained territorial, political, or economic control of the country, and uh, because they haven't been able to gain control, they've been escalating violence. So um, one of the things we need to understand is that uh, since first of February, so the first four months, February, the months of February, March, April, and May. We've had nearly 2,000 military armed attacks targeting people, civilians, or harming them. And if you look at 2,000 and compare it to last year, for the entire year of 2020, there were 1,024 um, similar attacks. So we're actually uh, being we're actually heading to a very severe situation. In, um, in one week at the end of April alone, there was more than 60 airstrikes targeted using fighter jets and attack helicopters, mainly targeting civilian populations. So, um, uh, and uh, last week there's, there's been a siege or an a, a attack on Demoso, a town in the east of the country a small town. They bombed a church and killed people who were sheltering in the church. Um, and they are bombarding these areas with artillery. It's actually a war. They are actually waging war against the people. It's not, not just a matter of going to houses and rounding up people. They're actually bombarding people with artillery and launching airstrikes on them. And in that state, in Kaya State, also known as Kareni State, which is a small state near the Thai border, one in three people in the whole state has been displaced by conflict since the 1st of February. So this is the kind of intensity that's going on. But at the same time, what is really inspiring and amazing about this movement is that it's been led by young people and women. Mm. And, uh, you know, for many years, I've been working to support the, I've been a supporter of the human rights and democracy movement in Burma, Myanmar, since 1988. And people keep, and I've been working to support human rights causes around Southeast Asia. And it's kind of interesting that the oppressors always say that democracy and human rights is not part of our culture, mm. that, um, that we need to have strong leadership and uh, forceful leadership to keep everyone united and in check. But what we saw, and in fact, some, some of the Western diplomats and donors even ask us such things like, you know, maybe it's too much to ask to expect that people will adopt these so-called Western values. And the, the reality is that um, actually the first idea of human rights started in Persia. Darius, Darius the conqueror, actually after he conquered uh, uh, communities and towns would actually insist that the local people not be used as slaves and that they have legal rights um, and, and have a right to protection. And so we'll be talking about human rights and democracy. It didn't necessarily come from the West. Mm -hmm. So when we see what's going on now, as soon as the coup happened, who were the first to hit the streets? It was young people and women, feminists, and youth saying, no, this is not acceptable. And then that inspired civil servants to develop their civil disobedience movement to go on strike. And that was supported by civil servants up to the rank of director general. So we saw, um, we saw this amazing thing where it was the young people who demanded 
we don't want this 2008 military constitution to be amended. We just want it to be trash. We need to rewrite, we need to have a new constitution that is inclusive. They demanded that uh, the Rohingya genocide be recognized as such and demand, and they made public apologies for genocide denial. The genocide just happened a few years ago in 2017. The military uh, regime, the military actually started a genocidal campaign against the Rohingya, which the UN recognizes as one of the most persecuted pe peoples in the world in the Western state of Rakhai. And in doing so, uh, forced nearly a million Rohingya to leave the country and flee to overcrowd an overcrowded refugee camp in Bangladesh. So that Rohingya refugee camp is now the largest camp in the world, the refugee camp in the world. So, you know, so it, for, and, and basically the state denied there was genocide. When Gambia sued Burma for genocide of the Rohingya at the International Court of Justice, uh, uh, there was so much anger against the Rohingya and, um, uh, and Muslims in general that this was an attack on the country and not a pursuit for accountability for what the military did. So now we've seen that shift where we have a national unity government, which is actually the government formed by 76% of elected members of parliament from the November 2020 election. And that national unity government, which is uh, been charged with treason, which is a capital offense in the country by the military, um, are still operating. They started, um, they started in mid-April, and that was um, uh, a, a government that was set up by the elected parliamentarians in partnership with ethnic, ma ethnic minority groups that had been traditionally excluded from the political process. So now we have a national unity government where more than half of the cabinet come from ethnic minorities, where a, th where a third of the cabinet are women. And for the first time in history, we've also got the first out gay man as a minister in the cabinet. And this is the most diverse and inclusive uh, government at this point. And they've been working despite being threatened with treason, despite having to move around and to be in hiding. They have been working really, really hard to push for the international community not to allow funds to flow to the military. So uh, I think one of the really exciting things is how so many social taboos have been broken down. For example, in Orthodox Buddhist uh, Burmese thought, um, anything a woman wears below the waist is considered polluting. And, um, and so uh, when women uh, wash their, do their laundry, their sarongs, also known as tamain in, in, in Burmese, have to be hung separately sometimes below um, the house or uh, away from where it might, ex we might accidentally be touched by a man. And for a man to, to walk under a woman's sarong is considered uh, extremely bad luck and, um, uh, and polluting, their sp and spiritually polluting. So women started stringing up lines across the streets and hanging their, their tamains, their sarongs, and um, what that meant was the military and the police didn't want to cross under those sarongs. And so if military or police trucks wanted to enter an area, they would have to stop and get someone to cut the line and pull down all the sarongs so they can drive over the sarongs instead of under. And that was a really useful tactic to delay um, uh, security from entering neighborhoods that people had time to hide or run away. And, um, and then uh, men started waving the women's sarongs over their head as a sign of defiance against the military. So we saw these kinds of uh, taboos broken. And, um, and uh, in, the, in the first wave of the national rallies, uh, the LGBT community came in drag. And traditionally, even some of the human rights community would look down 
on uh, LGBT community and be, uh, or even make fun of them. But this time they welcomed them as peers and supported their presence. So, so the LGBT community also feels validated and, and understands that this is the way we need, this is the wave of inclusion that we need to keep moving on to build, to keep on the momentum that this is not a Rosie the Riveter situation where, you know, women and LGBT are welcome, their leadership are welcome, and then when the crisis is over, they'll have to go back to, to the status quo. So this is really important to understand that this uprising is not just an anti-coup, anti-military uprising. It's a pro-democratic uh, movement um, that, that is redefining the status quo. That was so tremendous, the way you put it, by saying that Thank you. this is not just anti-authoritarian, uh, and anti-coup, but that it has this amazing affirmative content specifically spelled out in relationship to women's rights and the rights of minorities. And this is so um, different from so many other experiences we've seen around the world, where as you said, women and minorities are brought in just to overthrow the, the old enemy and then then they have to, their struggles and demands are put aside as secondary. So, I mean, I think just we need to support the struggle, both to help the Burmese and to help the rest of us in the rest of the world um, to get inspiration from this struggle. I think we learned in, in 1988, there was the 8888 uprising, August 8, 1988 uprising in the country in Burma. And that's the generation we came from. And when we talked about rights for women, rights equal equality, most of the leadership said, uh, you know, let's get rid of the military first, and then we can talk about this. So that you know, like we need freedom first to be able to talk about this. And many people learned a bitter lesson from that. So this time, people say, no way. We got we got to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. Ah, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. So hopefully this conversation will make a lot more people aware of this very unique nature of the Burmese struggle and the, the urgency of, of supporting it. And so this is a good transition to the uh, question that I would like to now ask from Romarilyn, <clears throat> which is, that uh, you are a Romarily, you are a feminist abolitionist scholar and activist in the US. You have experienced long term incarceration and police brutality firsthand. Last year, we saw millions of people of all races in the US embrace the Black Lives Matter uprising, oppose police brutality, and mass incarceration after the police lynching of George Floyd. And yet, the majority of the white adult population in the US still have a favorable view of the police and do not support abolishing the system of mass incarceration. According to the latest polls, while 50% of US adults somewhat support Black Lives Matter, only 30% of all US adults strongly support Black Lives Matter. Why is support for the police and the prison system so entrenched in the US and not only among whites? Thank you so much, Frida, for the invitation to have this conversation. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this panel today. And Debbie, it's a pleasure to meet you. And thank you so much for your labor in this movement over the centuries. I am truly honored to be here with you all. First, I want to uh, acknowledge, you know, the, the beautiful, powerful protests and vigils and gatherings by the young folks of all persuasions last year. You know, Debbie mentioned, you know, how, you know, these movements are, are really uh, being led by youth and women. 
And we've seen the same thing here in the US after you know, the, the world saw the murder of Mr. Floyd. And during a pandemic, you know, the young people that we have, this generation is fearless. They are fearless, uh, they are committed, and, and they are about being the change makers that we want to see. This generation is truly inspiration. Frida, you asked a great question. Um, I see both questions as connected. You know, why is it that half of the American population somewhat supports BLM and less than a third strongly support BLM? You know, do, do you think it would have been a different outcome or different results if it was about all lives matter, if the question was framed in that way? You know, I think that it would have been different results. But whenever we use Black or Blackness and talk about Black people, there's resistance to that. There's resistance to our lives mattering. There's resistance to Black people just being able to live in the U.S. And it's, it's, it's quite indicative of our history. And it's not surprising that white Americans are threatened by this movement for Black lives. However, one would think that with all the cultural appropriation that has been extracted from Black communities, from our music, dance, fashion, our body image, our swag, jargon, inventions, et cetera, et cetera, and so on, that Black people would be more appreciated and revered in this country instead of demonized and criminalized. But really, to your point, why shouldn't Black lives matter? Black people have labored for centuries in this country, building its agricultural wealth, paving roads, laying infrastructure, building monuments, and let us not forget, being bred and sold to create economic riches for white families mm -hmm. while we raise and nurse their children. Perhaps it is because of the public safety rhetoric that continues to criminalize blackness. Maybe it's the media that often depicts black people and black communities as scary drug and gang infested places that are undeserving of well-funded, high quality schools, parks, and libraries. I think black America has been framed as illegitimate and this illegitimacy framing has been the dominant narrative in the US for over 400 years. It is what continues to justify the murdering, lynching of black men, women and children and the incarceration of black people by racist and anti-black systems of oppression. Many folks don't see black people or our Blackness as respectable, as deserving of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or as kind and intelligent. Over the course of history, our government has socially constructed tyrannical, sociological, and psychological ideals that has resulted in Black bodies being labeled three-fifths of a human, violent and deviant in nature, and other inhumane references which are embedded in our educational system, American culture, and our psyche. Which is why support for the police and prison system is so entrenched in the US and not only among whites. Many black and brown people also feel that policing as it is right now is okay, that we need prisons. We need a place to send those who are undeserving, who are evil, who are Black. As Americans, we are well-trained and conditioned to see my skin color as a problem that needs to be controlled, punished, or destroyed. Dr. Angela Yvonne Davis talks about this in her book, Are Prisons Obsolete? Davis says that the prison is present in our lives. And at the same time, it is absent from our lives. 
And that to think about this simultaneous presence and absence is to begin to acknowledge the part played by ideology in shaping the way we interact with our social surroundings. That's why many of us cannot imagine a world without prisons or policing reimagined where black people aren't suspect or subjected to police violence when exercising our constitutional right to exist. Davis also says that we think about the prison as a fate reserved for others, for evildoers. Again, Black Americans have been historically framed as evil, nefarious, and subhuman. Why else would our government go to such lengths to criminalize us after the Emancipation Proclamation? There was the 13th Amendment, there was vagrancy laws, Black codes, Jim Crow segregation, lynching, voter suppression, and now mass incarceration. I mean, the U.S. continues to create these systems of oppression designed especially for Black people. They're all intentionally designed to dismantle, disrupt and disenfranchise people from the African diaspora. People that look like me. I mean, just walking down the street, minding your own business, you can be assaulted by a police officer, you know, hoping that you'll, you won't have an ID or you'll have marijuana on you or you'll be a parolee. I mean, it's just so ingrained within the American culture that there's something inherently wrong with black people, that it's okay to just randomly harass us. And then when we exercise our rights to ask questions and to question, you know, these regimes of power, then we are victimized, if not terrorized. Davis also raises the significance of media images in shaping our views of prison. And the media is a powerful weapon and a constant source of crafting these ideologies that create fear, that criminalize and continue to harm black bodies. So, you know, when we think about the American prison system, the criminal justice system that we have. You now America holds 25% of the prison population and, and yet it's only 5% of the world's population. You know, that should be alarming to our government. You know, 2.3 million people are incarcerated in this country and disproportionately those who are serving time in these cages are black and brown people. And it's time to put a stop to it. So this fear, this animosity, this, this uneasiness or, you know, that some white Americans have and people of color have about the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, they, they need to just take a look at history instead of being, I think, controlled by fear and, uh, and by the media and its depiction of people that they rarely know anything about. I think it's really important for the BLM movement to continue to do its work. I'm really grateful for the young folks and, and the Black women who have been marching for decades, on top of decades, making sure that our Black communities you know, survive. And as a Black woman, you know, survival is, is part of our DNA. So I'm just really thankful for the question, Frida, and very thankful to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much for your answer. I mean, it's such a tough question. Um, as someone who, you know, has lived in the U.S. for decades, um, I can just say that the the combination of the the actual material conditions of the segregation and the ideological um, effort to dehumanize black people is just 
it's just so poisonous to our brains in a in a not even of course well, in a conscious and an unconscious way and it's going to take so much work and a real transformation of society to really uproot this kind of attitude um but at the same time you know it is this is really is a critical moment where uh it's, we can't we can't say it's only up to the black lives matter uh activists to do their job we all of us whatever our race or our uh, ethnicity is we have a responsibility to address this issue of anti-black racism in the US and how ingrained it is. Personally, as a librarian, I feel that it's it's especially important for me to address this in relationship to the public and um, not uh, and, and I know that everything that we has to that this is the number one priority when it comes to I, I believe this is the number one priority when it comes to my work as a librarian to address the issue of racism in the United States and to make people in the United States aware of their history. And, uh, and, and, and of course, that's part of the problem too, that so much of that history is not even known by, by so, many, so many people. So, um, it, okay, so we're talking about, uh, we're talking about struggles against police brutality, authoritarianism, and really the problems within. So it's, it sounds so far like the, the Burmese are way ahead of all of us because they're, they're opposing both police brutality and authoritarianism and also at the same time addressing uh, um, misogyny, sexism, and ethnic um, uh, discrimination. Um, in the US- But, but Frida, um, it, it's, the thing is that the movement leaders are talking about this um the grassroots leaders are talking about this young people are being very very upfront about this but at the same time i think romarilyn um you know when when the the kind of uh, fake logical reasoning to say all lives matter why why only black lives okay we had black lives matter black lives matter uh the point has been made let's move on this is the type of uh debate and minimization that's also happening in the burmese movement mm -hmm. um that the thing is that it's like yeah okay you said sorry but you said sorry for the rohingya um, you acknowledge the violence that has been hap that's happened in recent weeks against ethnic minorities, and but then you can't say we're all in this together because the structural violence, the economic violence, the social violence, the demonization of minorities is not something that can be wiped away overnight, and people feel still feel uncomfortable to re be reminded of the structural and historical. Uh, 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 injustices that are still going on and that need to be addressed. They think they think that, oh, you know, okay, we've acknowledged it once and then let's move on. And it's like, no, people can't move on because they're still in that situation. And um, and and it's the same when we're talking about feminism and addressing misogyny. It's kind of like, oh, you know, um, uh, uh, not all men are like that. Like not all white people are like that. Not all mainstream uh, dominant group are like that. That that same type of of uh, minimization and the same type of tokenism is still something that all of us are grappling with. So I think that's what, when we look at how governments justify it and how um, uh, people in society, uh, people in the streets justify it, it, it the, the logic and the arguments are so frighteningly similar. Mm -hmm. So I think that that that's part also of, you know, even in, amongst um, dissidents in Iran, it's like yes you have a point but can you just let it go now and get with the program and don't you know don't don't rock the boat that mm -hmm. whole that whole uh attitude is something that 
that it's going to be taking a lifetime of struggle to dismantle. And, I, and, and these are the, 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 I, the attitudes that we are fighting because as we're struggling with the external struggle, with the security forces, with, with mass incarceration, with the street violence, we still have to struggle to dismantle those attitudes because people hold on to those attitudes and that what, that's what they use to justify brutality ongoing systemic brutality against the majority of the population sorry i just got passionate about that with no, hearing, no, no, no. hearing both I, of you i i appreciate that um i mean you mentioned iran and uh, uh, definitely that is a huge problem in iran in that we've had two uprisings since uh, 2017 mass uprisings really demanding the overthrow of the iranian regime and based on based on accurate statistics i can say that 75 percent of the iranian public is opposed to the regime but when it comes to the issue of women's rights and the rights of of national and ethnic minorities or religious persecuted religious minorities there is just that sensitivity on a mass basis is just not there and so although things have, there's more sensitivity than there was 40 years ago when the Islamic Republic took over and, and destroyed the revolution, but still it's a real problem. And this is preventing us from uh, challenging uh, authoritarianism and overcoming authoritarianism. And in the US it's, it's, it's holding us back mm -hmm. um, with, you know, it's, it's strengthening the white supremacists Yep. It's making the situation very, very dangerous. Well, all branches of our government here in the U.S. are controlled by the white minor uh, majority. So it's, it's hard. You see it being played out every day. It's extremely hard to, to progress, yeah. you know, because it's, it's just saturated with, with whiteness and American culture. And because of that, you know, even when we have elected officials who are who are black and minorities uh, in office, it's hard for them to even move legislation and policy through that will impact, you know, minority groups in this country. So it's 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 such a struggle because you know white supremacy is is so embedded in the American culture and this hatred for people of color, especially black people, is so embedded in this country. And because of that, there's just this heightened fear of black people, you know, no matter who you are, what you look like, you know, just out of the corner of your eye, if you see a brown person, you know, there's, there's a, a reaction that you have. It's embedded in our psyche that, that danger, beware. And so it justifies the killing of our men, women, and children every time for having cell phones or, you know, other objects in their hand or just resisting, period. You know, we're not supposed to resist. We're supposed to always be dominated in this country, controlled, confined, and it, it has to stop. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement has really helped to educate, you know, the general public around these issues. Yes. And just having, you know, these young folks from all walks of life and from all races and groups be a part of this movement has helped, you know, the parents and grandparents of those folks start to see that it's, it's time you know, for America to move forward and stop being so anti-Black. Yeah, that's the only way it can move forward, exactly. The only way it can move forward. But that's, that also means our own communities have to stop being anti-Black. A lot of the violence happens in our own communities and especially against Black women. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're Black and trans, Oh my gosh, you know, there's just so much violence to our bodies and it's coming from, you know, every, every racial group. No doubt about it. 
so it resonates so much what you say about Iran as well. And and so I'm going to go to uh, the next question for Romarilyn, which is uh, Romarilyn, do you think U.S. abolitionist feminism can become a point of attraction to bring these struggles together? It seems to me that abolitionism's opposition to dehumanization and its demand for the emancipation and self-actualization of the human being is the foundation for its opposition to the carceral system. What can abolitionist feminism teach us that is universal and global? That is a huge question. <laughs> I wish I had the answers to that. Um, wow, thank you, Frida. I, I, I think women and the, the, the feminine that lives within us all really has the power to do amazing things, you know, anything, especially uh, when it's part of a struggle for freedom and liberation. You know, when we, when we tap into uh, that struggle for freedom and, and liberation, it's, it's like all of our ancestors you know, come and join us in the fight. I mean, it's, it's really powerful. Um, that's why we're still here. That's why black women are still here. That's why we still have black people. We can still give birth, you know, underneath the, the tremendous weight of imperialism and anti-blackness and racism in this country and continue to you know, thrive. It's it's quite amazing when I think about my grandmother and my mother and my great grandmother and, and, and their mothers you know, who had to survive, you know, some of the worst conditions uh, in this country and, and they made it. You know, when I think about my life that I never could have survived that, but I probably would have if I would have been born at that time. That's just the resiliency of black people and no matter how this government you know tries to keep its knee or foot on our neck we survive so i think abolitionist feminism is teaching us that uh, we have a global movement calling for you know defunding and the transformation of law enforcement and that includes the department of corrections you know abolitionist feminism is is I, I think bringing us together as a community of different types of organizations and grassroots orgs to look at uh, incarceration, mass incarceration and uh, violence against women in a, in a certain light. And it's just really been amazing, you know, to be a part of a movement where you know, anti-violence and harm by the state is also being addressed, you know, and that's, that's something that has been in the works for decades. You know, when Insight was, and, you know, Beth Ritchie and Elisa Bieria and all of those really amazing Black queer women were, were struggling, trying to get people to notice and realize that, you know, abolitionist feminism is about tearing down all of the systems of oppression that exist. Those that are against blackness, those that are against women, those that are against queer and trans folks, all of it, especially all of the gender-based violence. And um, I think, you know, we want the world that is, we want a world, we want to see a world that's inclusive. And I think you mentioned that, Debbie, when you were talking about Inclusivity, that's, that's what we want. We want it to be a safe place where we all can, you know, live and live freely and have self-determination. I think that's what abolitionist feminism is bringing to the world today. You know, it's calling people, to, you know, to a higher calling, you know, to not just see um, the actions of individuals, but to consider you know, all of the social ills that help to produce, create, you know, some of the problems that exist that lead to incarceration, that leads to violence, that leads to harm. 
That's why I think Miriam Cabo's work is so magnificent and so important. You know, transformative justice. You know, we have to address harm, but we can't address harm by creating more harms. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, abolitionist framework is so critical to how we approach, you know, um, prison abolition, how we approach gender violence in this world, how we approach anti-Blackness in this world. You know, it has to be from a place where we don't continue to create harm or institutions and structures that we have to continuously tear down another five, 10 years or another decade away. So I think we've learned a lot of lessons from abolitionist feminism and we will continue to do so with, with this next generation. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that uh, um, the, uh, uh, you mentioned a few of the names and it's so important for the international viewers to be aware of all the work that abolitionist feminists have done, all the writings, all the books they've published and articles and analyses. I mean, it's really quite a, an amazing body of work and uh, it's economic, it's social, it's political. Um, and Mariam Kava's latest book, of course, which I'm, I'm in the middle of reading right now. Um, we do this I, till we free us. Yes, yes, yeah, on transformative justice. Right. The so, personal is political. Yes, so, absolutely. You know, it has to be. So there's something very specific about US abolitionist feminism that I think the international audience shouldn't take for granted. I mean, when we talk about abolitionist feminism, there's something very specific about the US contribution, both in the last 20, 25 years, but historically, the whole history of abolitionism in the US anti-slavery struggle, that cannot be skipped over. We can't say, oh, we're abolitionist feminism and off to our own thing. We have to really address that contribution in a very specific way and show that we are knowledgeable about it and can discuss it. Um, and if we want to add to it, we can, but only if we really delve into it, um, not if we just pay lip service to it. So um, I appreciate that very much. And um, this is something we'll, we'll have more conversations on in, in future, future dialogue. Um, Debbie, before I go to the next question, which is for you, is there anything you want to say about this question? I think, I think what is quite clear, whether you're in Iran, in Burma, or in the US, pretty much every part of the world, the, the, the dehumanizing mass incarceration, the state and structural violence, uh, and the misogyny, and, very, and there's a strong element of misogyny in all of this violence. Mm -hmm. This is the ultimate systemic expression of toxic masculinity. And the, the problem is that women also internalize the, those, the, the, the attitudes and the values of that, that perpetuate toxic masculinity because we're put in this situation of whether you're a good woman, which means you're trying to raise your kids and influence everyone to fit with the system, or whether you're a troublemaker, um, uh, trying to buck the system, trying to change it, challenging it. And so um, the, 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 this is something that we have to be continually conscious about. And, and, and when we're talking about decolonizing our language, our, our writings, the way we do things, this is the fundamental transformation um, that all of us are working for. And we need to understand the micro and the macro that we are so we have to align that in how we do our work and how we think. And we have to call ourselves out when we find that's happening within ourselves. And I think this is the thing that um, you know we can't we can't pigeonhole feminism in you know a little box because we're actually talking about how we shape the future, 
how we are going are shaping the future and we have to be actively thinking sometimes we we have been schooled to think about solving the problem now problem solving more fixing the problem but actually we need to think about how we fix the problem is actually how we create the future and we need to 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 think with that mindset mm -hmm. um, this is why resilience is so important when Romalyn is, is sharing her personal family history it's it's your mother your grandmother your great grandmothers all of them being resilient because they know there's going to be a future and they're thinking about the next generation. They got to get there. They got to get the next generation out, you know. And and I think we we do need to be intentional and understand that we are not just solving problems. We are creating future. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That's that's really what I think what makes the adding these socialist feminist dimensions so critical because it, it just doesn't stop at the level of saying we're opposed to this or that, but brings in the affirmative dimension. And, and I agree with you that uh, there's something very specific about the misogyny and uh, the mass incarceration that when, when we talk about capitalist authoritarianism in the 21st century, a fundamental part of it is this mass incarceration that's also connected to, um, to the enslavement of women's bodies. And, uh, you know, we see that everywhere. We, I mean, well, specifically, I mean, look at what they're doing to the Rohingya, what, they, what the Burmese government has done to Rohingya Muslim women, what the, um, in, Ch in China, in Xinjiang, they're doing to, um, to Uyghur women, uh, with, you know, mass rape um, and, uh, and the, the way in which women's bodies are object, objectified and dehumanized in um, the US mass incarceration system, even though women are a relatively smaller part of the two, of the 2.3 million, what is it, 200,000 uh, women, is that correct? But still the way in which women's bodies are objectified and dehumanized it's very much a, a, a very singular aspect of this current stage of capitalist authoritarianism that we're talking about. So we cannot fight capitalist authoritarianism without fighting, without addressing this dimension of the connection between mass incarceration and, 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 and gender violence. And that's, and that's what I love about abolitionist feminism in the US, that it brings that connection it, you know, very explicitly in, in the body of work that, that people like uh, Angela Davis or Ruth Gilmore, Mariam Kaba, Beth Ritchie and others have-, have, have And Romarilyn Ralston. And Romarilyn Ralston, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So thank you. Mm, let me go to the uh, next question and So a question for Debbie. Generally in the US, activists only support an international struggle if it involves US imperialist intervention. In the case of Burma, the Biden-Harris administration has imposed sanctions on the Burmese military government. The governments providing arms to the Burmese military are China, Russia, and India. What would you say to US activists about why the Burma uprising affects them and why their solidarity is needed? Um, one of the great things that's been happening in the past few weeks is young people leading protests against Chevron in different cities of the US because Chevron has been working in partnership with the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise which is now in control, under the control of the illegal junta in Burma, but also, um, uh, also working in partnership with companies, uh, French oil companies like Total. Now, oil and gas, especially natural gas, is the biggest single income earner, foreign exchange revenue earner for Burma. And now billions of dollars 
could be under the control of the military. And the military, you know, we have to understand that the military is not going to use that for human rights trainings. It's going to use it for more weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Chevron and Total in a joint venture, they have a small joint venture, and they actually agreed not to pay any revenues to the military junta. But that's only a small proportion. Chevron has actually been engaged in lobbying against sanctions to be imposed on oil and gas from Burma. Hmm. So one of the things that we need to understand is um, uh, at the beginning, when the coup happened, the US government was able to, within a few days, able to freeze $1 billion worth of asset, assets the junta was trying to take out of the, of the US banking system. And, and U.S. has taken the lead in terms of sanctioning military-owned companies. Um, and that's because there's a huge uh, community and a huge community, not just of people from Burma, but also activists, American activists who've been actively in solidarity with them that moved very quickly uh, to push the Biden administration. Uh, to, to take action. And in fact, at the moment, the US is actually leading in terms of what actions can be taken against the military. So the US starts it, and then eventually UK and EU follow, the EU and Europe, UK and Europe. So one of the things that's really important is actually to ensure that um, people in the US understand what's going on and understand that they have they are able to exercise that power to make sure that the US government doesn't misstep on Burma. And the, pop, the movement, the movement in the country already started boycotts of military products because military companies in Burma produce things like sports goods, beer, they actually produce Myanmar beer, et cetera. So there was this domestic boycott going on and the movement pushed very hard for the US to impose sanctions. Now we're talking about actually um, uh, imposing banking sanctions to make sure that bank accounts under the control of the junta do not, are not able to receive funds from overseas. So that's really important. Um, it's, it's, it's rather bizarre and ironic that you know, for many other movements, the US is quite roundly condemned and justifiably so in the past for um, military interference and political interference um, uh, against democratic regimes. And whether it's in Latin America or other parts of the world or the Middle East. But now um, we're trying to make sure that the US government gets it right and does right and hopefully that's how we can um, start moving things forward in terms of what US government policy does in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. the, so this is, this is something that's quite important, but I think it was a little bit easier to get the Biden administration to listen because the military used uh, election fraud mm -hmm. as an excuse to hold the coup. And so, um, and so they basically took a leaf out of Trump's book and used that. And the difference between Burma and the US is that um, the military had 450,000 soldiers and a lot of weapons to back up their desire to seize control. And, um, and the fact that Flynn has come out recently and said, there's no reason why it should not happen in the US is a deep, is a deep cause of con for concern. I think if you look at, um, uh, uh, Timothy Snyder puts out a very slim book of 10 articles about, uh, on tyranny. Mm -hmm. And he put this out about uh, three years ago. And if you read it, you start to understand that it applies to Burma, it applies to the US, it applies to Iran pretty much you know, this is the playbook of dictators and authoritarians. So if you value democracy in the US, you need to value democracy in Burma because we're all interconnected. Totally, I totally agree with that. Um, and Sissy, we're talking about um, 
uh, sanctions. I want to say in Iran, it's a little different in that the uh, the progressives are are against the U.S. sanctions because they're actually really hurting the masses. But for Iran, I think solidarity work can be done through really publicizing the cases of the um, the feminists, the imprisoned feminists, the labor activists who are in jail, the teachers, the um, environmental activists who are in jail. And also, since we're talking not only about political prisoners, but social prisoners, uh, the Iranian government has not said what it did with the 7, 000, over 7,000 people that, yeah, mostly young unemployed people that it arrested after the 2019 uprising. We don't know what happened to most of them. They're in jail, but nobody is helping them. They don't have money to put, post bail. Uh, and also just the Iranian government itself has admitted that it has the official prison population is now 190,000, mostly there for very minor offenses like drug use or uh, minor theft. So talk, talking about mass incarceration, this is mass incarceration. And so activists around the world really need to hold the Iranian government accountable for, for these atrocities. And, um, and, and publicize the cases of these prisoners. And there is plenty of information there. You can go to Penn International, you can go to uh, Center for Iran Human Rights, you can go to uh, Iranian Progressives in Translation, United for Iran, I might've skipped a few, other, oh, the nasreenfilm.com site, a film about the uh, Iranian feminist human rights activist Nasrina, so today a beautiful film. So there are plenty of things that people can do and you're welcome to contact me. So no shortage of things. Romarilyn, what are your suggestions about what, how, how people can uh, uh, express solidarity with the struggles in the US or any of, of what we've said on, on solidarity work? I, I think you, you nailed it, uh, Frida. You know, we, we need to, number one, know where to contact folks. So all the sites that you just mentioned, you know, if there was, you know, some way of getting all of those sites out to grassroots organizations who are doing this type of political work and political education, which most of our movements are doing, political education, and, you know, around, of course, abolition and reform and, and but it should also include the solidarity piece with you know other countries other nations you know uh, with Burma with uh, Iran you know we need to we need to have an international lens to our abolitionist work and uh, to our framework and I think that's you know you have folks like Angela Davis and Dina Dent and Ruthie Gilmore who bring that um, but you know, for most uh, Black feminists and for most movement leaders in, in the U.S., you know, our hands are so full with our own issues. But I think we need to really be intentional about bringing in this global perspective because, you know, when, when Black people get free, we all get free. When Iranian people are free, we all get free. When Burmese people are free, we all get free. And so we need to be working towards the liberation and freedom of all of us. That's why I just, I love Angela Davis. You know, freedom is a constant struggle. It is a constant struggle. It is our struggle as marginalized people in this world. And I, I think that should be our mantra, our call, you know, uh, one of our points uh, of, of liberation is to, you know, we say free them all. We need to really mean free them all. You know, not just free them all in the U.S., free them all in California prisons, free them all in, you know, uh, in, in, in America, but literally free them all around the world. And so I, I think the work that Debbie's doing and has done for decades, which I am just in awe of, and I've learned so much from you today, is, is incredible. And, and what you do, Frida, is, is just amazing. I mean, you don't sleep. You are, you are in the trenches, and you are making sure that 
these connections are able to take place uh, so that other people can see the connections and similarities so that we can stop operating in silos and in our own community, but not to, and, and reach across the aisle, reach across the state, reach across the ocean and uh, make sure that when we talk about freedom, we're talking about freedom for all. So um, those are pretty much my, my thoughts and, and I'm going to I'm going to be more intentional about, you know, when I'm in these organizing spaces to, to bring in, you know, my, my sisters, my brothers, my, my others, you know, from around the world. When we talk about solidarity, we need to really talk about solidarity because solidarity means all of us. And that's one of our chants with all of us and none. We say all of us and then the response is or none. And so in this, in this call and response, we need to bring in all of us. When we say all of us, we mean all of us. And so I, I'm just really pumped up about, you know, what has taken place here tonight and, and how my eyes have been open and my heart. So thank you. Well, thank you, Romarlin and Frida. You've opened my mind and my heart too. And, you know, um, we might be on the other side of the world, but we know who Breonna Taylor is. We yeah, know yes, we, do. we know her. We remember her. We remember all the other women as well and children. Um, and, and, and I think um, if one thing that we have to do, as you, as you remind us, that we all have to be intentional and and inclusive in our intention. So it's wonderful that we are all connected in this way. Yes, and if people want to contact um, Debbie or Romarilyn, you bo you're both on Facebook, mm -hmm. so you are easy to reach. Uh, I'm on <laughs> Facebook and I also have a, a blog, uh, Iranian Progressives in Transition. You're welcome to contact us if you want ideas for solidarity work. And um, it's been wonderful to have this opportunity for this conversation with both of you. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope that this conversation makes an impact on others who hear it and that people get back to us. Well, solidarity and love to you all. Thank you Thank so, you. so much. Thank you. And, and thank you, Frida, for putting us together. Yes. Oh, thank thank you. you. I'm going to stop the recording now.